Hello, um, welcome. My name is Derek. I'm your instructor for the uh, operating systems class. Um, this video is from the uh, chapter five, so I'm going to do a series of hopefully rather small videos um, about concurrency. So it, it's it's a very important topic. Um, uh, in fact, you know, I would say it's, it's maybe the most important topic in our operating systems class. So it's it's usually easier to understand virtual memory and job scheduling things, but but kind of the heart of some of the hardest stuff and the most important stuff really happens about concurrency. Okay, so in this first video, like I said, I'm going to try and keep it relatively quick, but I want to show an example of concurrency just to make certain that you. Um, understand what we mean and what the issues are here okay so we're going to show a detailed example of some of the problems with concurrent operations um, and present some ideas for potential solutions uh, which will kind of set us up for the next video here then so um, real quickly I don't want to spend some time I don't want to spend a lot of time on these examples I have two quick examples um, so if you ever take like a, a an ethics class or something, you might study some case examples of, of where you know software engineering caused damage or harmed people and things. So concurrency is hard. So lots of examples can be found of where incorrectly handling concurrency in systems caused problems and caused death. So one of the most well known, most famous is this uh, Theric Twenty Five system. Um, and it was basically a, a, you know an x-ray kind of system, sort of medical based system. So basically here a type of race condition, which is a type of concurrency issue that you'll learn about, um, caused overdosing of patients. So, and unfortunately they determined that data entry speed was the key factor in producing the error conditioning. So basically the more experienced operators who, were, who would type really fast would, would would cause this race condition to happen and, and kill their patients, okay? Um, another uh, issue that was really a concurrency issue uh, based um, was the, the first launch of the space shuttle. So people didn't die on this one, but, you know, they had to abort the launch and it cost lots of money. Um, and amazingly enough, this was at the time, and probably still is, one of the most heavily tested systems, but this bug still managed to evade the testing. So in this case, basically because of a, um, of a, uh, um, again, another kind of race condition, so an, an insertion of an, an initialization and a timing issue uh, would cause a 1 in 67 chance that one of the computers would become, would be out of sync with the others. And basically, if, if the computers are out of sync, that causes an abortion, uh, an abort of the, uh, the, the launch, basically. So, uh, I, I only, I only bring these up just to point out that, I mean, concurrency is really hard. I mean, you can have, spend lots of money and have lots of people looking over the stuff, and, and these kinds of issues would still, can still get passed, you know, um, uh, and, and, and still end up in your system. So uh, hopefully, you know, one of the goals is that you begin to understand why concurrency can be so so hard. Okay. So I'm going to first talk about just a, a few definitions. Um, so to understand a concurrent program, you need to understand what uh, the underlying atomic operations are. Okay. So an atomic operation is one that is that always runs to completion or not at all. All right. So it's indivisible. Right. So certain thing that the, the, the fundamental building blocks. Okay. So if we have, so when I talk about concurrent processes or concurrent threads, that means they're running at the same time on the same system, and they're maybe trying to access the same resources at the same time, um, or they're trying to access the, a same bit of critical code at the same time. Okay. So so atomic operations are critical. That the, they mean that when you do an operation, only one thing is going to be able to do an atomic operation at a time. All right. So they provide the, the building blocks from which we build uh, concurrent mechanisms. So mechanisms to handle concurrency correctly. Okay. So on most machines, um, machine instructions are atomic, or at least most of the machine instructions are atomic. Okay. Not all. Uh, machine instructions are atomic, but most of the ones that aren't are, are kind of, you know, um, exceptions or, or they're, 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 they're exceptional for some reason, okay? But most of machine instructions are atomic, and basically we're going to start about talking about, you know, sort of like loads and stores. So when you, when you load a value from memory into like a register, 
to use it or when you store a value from a register back in the memory. Those will ha happen atomically, so the, the machine instruction will execute completely or it won't execute at all. Okay? So um, in concurrency we have multiple computations, so you can think of this either as multiple threads within a single process or multiple processes that are cooperating using a shared bit of memory. Either way, so as, as you should have read about or we talked about in a previous chapter, threads are defined as multiple concurrent entities that are all within a shared memory space, okay? But you can also have concurrency issues even among processes that uh, if they are trying to use a shared resource or a shared memory. Um, so we can talk about in concurrency fine grain versus coarse grain sharing. Okay, so um, so let me jump to an example real quickly. So maybe you know like a, about using a database, right? So in a database you have tables, and then in the table you have rows of data, right? So you can talk about uh, fine grain sharing would be in a database application would be uh, where you only lock on the row level. Okay, so in that case, you could have multiple concurrent uh, processes or threads using the database. And they could even be using changing data in the same table as long as they are locking different rows. Okay, or um, on the other end, we could lock uh, the database on a more coarse grain. So we might lock at the table level. So in that case, if one process locks a table, then if other processes, they, they could maybe do stuff in other tables, but they couldn't do stuff in that particular table that was locked, all right? So the advantage of fine grain sharing is that it increases concurrency, okay? So like, like if we're locking on the row level, uh, the, the other processes can do stuff in that same table without having to block and wait, all right? But it's more complex usually to implement fine grain sharing. So usually coarse grain sharing is simpler, uh, but it will lower the performance. Right? So uh, to, to hopefully better understand concurrency and how it works, uh, we're going to work through this example, um, the too much milk example, as I call it. I, I stole this from somebody uh, somewhere. So. so the great thing about operating systems um, is that there's an analogy, you know, it can be made between lots of things in an operating system and problems in real life, all right? So uh, I don't know if this is true that it would really help you understand real life problems better, but it's, it's definitely, you know, the, the, the goal is that this can help us understand concurrency, okay? Um, but computers are much more stupid. They're much stupider than people. So we'll see that where uh, these kinds of concurrency issues wouldn't be real problems for roommates, for real people, but, but they would be problems if we're implementing these as concurrent threads, for example, in a computing system, all right? So let's say our problem is, is that we have roommates, um, and the problem is we want to coordinate and, and buy milk whenever it's needed, okay? So we have a refrigerator, um, and our rule is that uh, if you want milk and you look in the fridge and there's no milk, you should go out and buy it and bring it um, back and put it in the refrigerator so all the roommates can share the milk, all right? But we have a problem with that algorithm I just, des just described because we also don't want to have too much milk, you know, so if we have too much milk, it'll go bad, um, um, and uh, we'll waste the milk. So we can easily have too much milk uh, if this happens. So roommate A comes home, looks in the fridge, we're out of milk, leaves for the store. But while they're out in this, doing this critical task, um, roommate B arrives, okay? And then when they look in the, in the fridge, they see that, that we're out of milk, so they go off and do the same task, okay? So then eventually roommate A comes back home, puts the milk in, but then B comes back in also. And we end up, the result is too much milk, okay? So um, uh, before I go back to the problem, a few more definitions. Um, so synchronization, when we talk about synchronization, that is where we're going to be using atomic operations to ensure cooperation between threads, okay? And so for now, only loads and stores are going to be atomic. Um, but we'll later we'll show how to build uh, a more powerful synchronization mechanism. All right. But in this example, we're going to show that it's hard to build anything useful with only a read or a store as atomic operations to build uh, synchronization mechanisms on. All right. So a critical section is a piece of code uh, that only one thread should execute at any given time. Okay. 
So the, the, the reason why our algorithm in the previous slide was uh, problematic is that our critical section could be entered or executed by two roommates at the same time. So we end up with bad concurrency. Bad. So we have no synchronization in that case, so we have bad synchronization. Uh, mutual exclusion um, is where we're ensuring that only one thread executes a critical section at a time, or one process executes in a critical section at a time. So in the pre again, in the previous example, we want mutual exclusion. We want to have some way to make certain that only one roommate is executing the cr critical task of getting milk at a time. Okay. So for mutual exclusion, one thread excludes the others while doing it. The task. All right? So, really, critical sections and mutual ex exclusions are just two ways of describing the same things. Okay? So, we need to use mutual, mutual exclusion to protect a critical section, and when something is in a critical section, it needs to exclude others, you know, mutually ex exclude other processes from entering that critical section. All right? um, so what we really need is a lock, so some sort of a mechanism that prevents someone from doing something. So basically we want to uh, uh, lock the critical section before entering it, entering it to prevent others from entering. We can also lock like data when we're doing shared memory, so shared data, so, so lock uh, data like lock a row in, in a table uh, before we access it or write to it. Um, and we want to unlock after you know, when, when we're done, when we're leaving, so that we can, so that other things can then access that critical section or that critical data. So, and, and we need to wait if locked, all right? So if, if we come to a place where we need, we want to acquire a lock before entering a critical section, if we find that it's already locked, we need to wait. There's, there's nothing else we can do but wait until the, the prior process or thread is done, okay? So this is an important idea. All synchronization involves locking and waiting, all right? So back to the fix the milk problem, you know, the too much milk problem. Um, how do we fix it? Um, so, we, you know, we could, in this case, again, it's an analogy, but we could get like a physical lock. So put a lock on the refrigerator, right? So, so every time we're going to go out to get milk, um, the, the roommate that's going to do the, the job of getting milk would lock the refrigerator. This would be a signal then to another roommate that comes along uh, that they wouldn't be able to then check whether there's milk and need to go get milk because it's locked, right? But this example is kind of a little bit too uh, coarse-grained, okay? It, it, it locks too much, okay? The, the roommate would be angry if they only want to get orange juice, right? Or if they want to make a meal. So they're, they're not working on the, the too much milk, uh, making certain that we have milk task, right? Um, and, uh, and another problem, we don't really know how to make locks yet, so... So if you ever take a class in concurrent programming or parallel programming, uh, you might talk about correctness properties and things like that, okay? So, uh, you know, we need to be careful. We need to make certain uh, about the correctness of our concurrent programs that we write, because concurrent programs are non-deterministic, all right? So, um, uh, if you ever do this formula, they talk about correctness properties, and you, uh, you always want to write these down ahead of time, write down your desired behaviors, because the impulse is to start coding, and when that doesn't work, you know, it becomes very aggravating. So think first, code later, right? So, um, Concurrent programs are non-deterministic because basically the operation of the computing system is non-deterministic. So I, I mean it's, it's random in this sense, that if I have multiple processes or threads running concurrently, um, there's no way to predict when the operating system is going to do a, a context switch or a thread switch and switch to another process. So lots of things can cause process to context switch. So it might time out, it might block waiting on something, um, some other process running in the system might cause uh, an interrupt, so, so some hardware interrupt might occur that might interrupt the current running process, and we might switch at that point. So for all those reasons, you know, th this kinds of context switching is, is non-deterministic, all right? So what are the correctness properties of the too much milk example? Um, so what we want is we want never more than one person to go buy the milk. 
but also if there's no milk, we we want somebody to buy it as soon as as soon as they check um, and buy it if it's needed. Okay, and so we want there to be milk, but we don't want too much milk. Um, and we need to solve this problem by restricting ourselves to using only atomic load and store operations as building blocks. So in this case, in the real world, our load and store we're going to simulate by using notes. So we're going to put a post-it note on the refrigerator to try and simulate um, locking uh, our critical section and unlocking. So taking the note off to, to unlock. So as I already mentioned, so we want to use a note to avoid buying too much milk. Okay, so leaving the note before buying is a kind of lock. It's like writing a value to memory, um, and re removing the note after buying is a kind of unlock. Again, it would be like an, another type of write um, when we get to talking about this in a real computing system. So, so the basic idea is that we, we agree that if you see the note, if the other roommate is buying milk, don't buy. And so, so wait to buy until the roommate buys it, all right, and then check whether they did it or not when they remove the note. Okay, so this would be kind of the pseudo code that our roommates would be doing. So, we, we check the refrigerator. If there's not if there's not any milk, we check if there's a note. And if there's not a note, that means that our roommate isn't buying milk. So we leave a note. We go to buy the milk, and, and once we've done that, we remove the note. Okay. So suppose a computer executes this. Remember, computers are stupid, right? So what's the result? Um, so let's say this sequence happens. So again, remember that context switching is non-deterministic. So let's say roommate A comes in, and there's no milk. So in this case, there's no milk, and there's no note. Okay, so, so they check and there's no note. Um, but before they can leave a note, you know, let's say roommate Bob comes in. Roommate B comes in, and they check, and there's no milk. So again, remember, think about like a single CPU system um, where these two processes or two threads are running concurrently. We did a context switch right here. So process B or roommate B checks, and there's not milk also, and there's not a note. But we have a problem now because now both of them, um, uh, you know, our note locking mechanism didn't work here because it's not atomic, right? So before, uh, so Alice decided that she needed to go um, get milk, but before she could lock, leave the note to, to, to perform the lock, Bob came in and checked and also decided to enter the critical section. The result is then, you know, so however we, we switch back, you know, uh, we're going to end up with too much milk. So if we switch back here at this point, Alice would leave the note, but that's not going to help because Bob has already decided that he's going to leave a note. It has already entered the critical section, right? So Bob, Alice leaves a note, buys milk, um, comes back, puts it in, removes the note, but then Bob also does that, right? The result is too much milk. Um, so in some sense, the solution is, is even worse. It fails intermittently, okay? So it, it would work sometimes, um, and um, uh, it actually would basically work in the real world because no, no roommates would be stupid enough if I'm standing there writing the note to not talk to them and to go um, and, and also start buying the milk, right? So clearly the, the, the note is not quite blocking enough. Uh, we could try and fix this by placing the note first, but what happens here, right? So again, with humans, nothing bad, right? Because they have common sense. But here, no milk is ever bought, right? So why not? Because if I, again, a computer is stupid, so if I leave a note um, and I check there's no milk, I need to buy milk, but there's already a note, okay? Right? So, so by that pseudocode, um, I skip over, assuming someone is going to be buying the milk because they, they locked and, and left milk in their name. Right? But nobody ever buys milk. So, so you can't put the, you can't leave the note beforehand either. That, that doesn't solve anything. Right? How about labeled notes? Okay, does this work? So roommate A leaves note A, um, and roommate B is going to leave note B. So, so the difference here is that we're checking the other roommate's note, whether the other roommate has left a note or not, right? So does this work? Maybe take a, a, a second to think about it. Um, 
it, it actually kind of does. It, it almost works. The only problem is um, there is starvation issues, okay, kind of literal in this case. So it is possible for a sequence like this to happen so that people keep not buying milk even when there's no milk. So that was our second correctness condition that we would like, right? We'd like to ensure that milk is bought when there is no milk. And so if this sequence happens, so if, if Alice leaves her note, and then we context switch over to thread B, and then Bob leaves his note, and then Bob continues on. So if there's not note A, but notice there is a note A, so Bob is going to decide not to, to uh, buy milk, right? So then if, we, then if we context switch over, so remember Bob's note is also on there. So now if we go back, um, Alice will see that, that Bob's note is there as well, and she's, she's going to assume that Bob is going to buy milk, so she will not buy the milk, all right? So again, this is really insidious, so um, it's unlikely that this would happen, but in a concurrent system, it has a way of happening at the worst possible time, okay? So this is, uh, I already mentioned, this is kind of a starvation, so kind of literal in, in the real roommate case, but um, uh, here, we, starvation is a technical term, in concurrency, it means that uh, a process is, you know, so something's never getting done that needs to be getting done in this case. All right. Here's a solution that does work, all right, um, and I'm not going to formally prove it, and kind of part of the point of this solution is it's, it's kind of complex. So even if you think about it a lot or try to simulate it by hand on paper a lot, you still might not go away convinced that it works, okay? So uh, in this case, we're going to in, um, employ some busy waiting, okay? So the structure is, is similar to before. We're using uh, separate notes. So roommate A, uh, Alice, will leave a note first. Uh, but uh, instead of just checking if there's no note B, uh, like we did before, uh, we, we busy wait, okay? Um, so while there's a note B, so, so if we if we see there's a note B, um, um, the, the, just to um, kind of jump to why we do that, basically what this does is, is it lets Alice, so, so we have a async, asynchronous behavior here, okay, so, so they're not doing, they're not behaving the same. So in this case, it basically allows Alice to kind of wait until, and see whether, what Bob is going to decide. So that will fix the previous problem that we had, right? So so if Bob ends up seeing the note and deciding not to, to, to um, buy milk, he would eventually remove his note B, um, and then that would allow uh, uh, thread A to stop busy waiting. Um, and then, you know, to go and, and buy the milk if it's needed then in that case, all right? Um, so this this actually does work. Like I said, I'm not going to kind of try and convince you of that. Um, but but you can formally show that it guarantees that it's either safe to buy or that someone will buy. Um, um, so it's okay to quit. Um, right? Okay. So if you go back to this, um, uh, a little bit of discussion, okay, so the, the solution protects the critical section using notes. Basically, um, the, the critical section is this, that, that we want to check if there's not milk and buy the milk if it's needed, but we want to make certain that only one roommate or only one thread is doing this critical section, at, you know, ever, right? Uh, if one is doing this check and buying if needed, all other roommates should never do the check um, and the buy you know, when one is set off to, to do this task here, okay? So as we already discussed a bit, solution three works, but it's really unsatisfactory, okay? It's complex even for the simple example. You know, it's kind of hard to convince yourself that it works. Um, um, A's code is different from B. Um, so, you know, what if we had three threads, okay? It's not obvious how how or even if we could extend that idea uh, to work with three or more threads or three or more roommates, okay? 
and also there's some busy weight you know point down so so that's that's unsatisfactory as well so so in that case a would be consuming cpu time if, if we used a busy weight like that where we continually check you know is the note b still there is the note b still there so there's a better way um um, so in this case, the whole problem comes about because we're using relatively primitive atomic instructions so that writing the notes is like a primitive load or a primitive storm. So we would like to have the hardware provide a better, um, higher level primitives than a single atomic load or a sim single atomic read or atomic write. Okay? Um, and that's what the next video is I'm going to talk about. So, so um, if, if we could build higher level programming extractions, uh, we can solve some, but not all, of these problems that we kind of identified with this example of concurrency. Okay? So, so far, um, just kind of to go back to the high level picture, the abstraction of threads from Chapter 4 is good. Okay? Um, it allows us to maintain sequential execution model for separate threads. Uh, that share memory, uh, which allows us to have simple parallelism, so that we can, you know, so, so you know, as you should have read about or we talked about in the previous chapter, you know, parallelism is good. So, so this allows multi-programming. So we can overlap I/O and, and overlap computation computation if we have multiple CPUs, um, and this allows us to increase uh, the utilization of our processor. But, as, as we just discussed, um, you know, atomic load or store is still too complicated to build anything, to, bu to build um, useful concurrency uh, applications, okay? So implementing a concurrent program with only primitives like that would be very tricky and error prone, okay? So we'll implement a higher level operation in the, our next video and t on top of atomic operations to provide... Um, a synchronization toolkit um, that will make it easier for us to build parallel applications that run concurrently. Okay. Um, suppose we have something, a, an atomic lock and, and an atomic um, acquire. All right. More on, on this uh, actually in the next video. Okay. If we had those, it would make the, 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 the milk, too much milk problem very easy. So if we had an acquire for a lock that was atomic, we could just acquire it. And then, you know, again, either we would acquire it and get past this, um, or uh, if we don't acquire it, uh, we, we wouldn't complete the, the acquire. Okay? So only one thing would be able to successfully acquire the way we're defining um, this here. So then we could go and check if there's uh, milk and buy it if it's needed. So the code between this acquire and release is called a critical section here, all right? Um, okay, so like I said, this sets us up for the next video. So in the next video, we're going to look how you build these kinds of mechanisms, all right? So that's it for this video, and I will see you in the next video then.